Hey everybody, good morning again. Thank you for moving to your seats. And uh, we've had a good start this morning with uh, Captain Gordy giving us a good view from the hill. Now we're in for a real treat. If you haven't heard uh, Adam Gordy speak, uh, uh, sit down, hold your seats. It's going to be a good one. He's a uh, great career. Came out of Elon College. Uh, my second CEO, Ray Sharp, who many people in the room know, uh, came from Elon College. So they turned out some good leaders at Elon. I saw him in the water down where he was. Uh, but Admiral Gordy is an attack pilot. He's commanded at about every level. Commanded Fifth Fleet. Been at the tip of the spear for us uh, in our nation, representing us. The director of the Joint Staff. And since he came to uh, Fleet Forces Command, has been at the forefront of uh, improving readiness, putting real emphasis on readiness kill chain, and bringing more fighting back to what we really need to have in the fleet and where we need to be, something that's near and dear to all of our hearts. So. Uh, he's a great advocate for the Service Navy, and we look forward to hearing from Admiral Gordon. Thank you very much. Wow, good crowd. Sea Lord, thanks for having me. You know, that's what we're calling, that's what we're calling uh, Surf Pack. We're calling him the Sea Lord. I'm a big fan of call signs. You don't get to pick your call sign, you embrace the one that you're given. He's embracing the Sea Lord. And, uh, uh, we really appreciate it. I'm going to have a discussion with you all today, and I'm really glad that it's in this particular forum and there's microphones out because I do want to have a discussion. I don't want to talk to you. I want to have a discussion with you. Uh, go through some slides uh, and then uh, open the floor up to your questions. I think that's the most meaningful part. Thanks, Donnie. Don't look into the light. That's the most meaningful part is hearing what you want to say put me on a spot and get a free shot at a four star. And I'll be happy to answer anything. We're taping it. And uh, so that means nothing is uh, off the record, but I'll give you an honest uh, answer to the, those things that I'm capable of answering. And if I don't like a question that you ask, I'll answer the question I want to answer, not the one that you ask. Uh, but uh, uh, thanks. Uh, like my predecessor, uh, old shipmate John Harvey, uh, tried to make it to every one of these. I'll be here at every one that you want me at. Uh, I think it's a, it's a terrific forum. I think it's a necessary forum that we get together and talk um, about critically important issues that face our Navy. Um, I do want to recognize uh, my closest shipmate in this particular job, and that's Cecil Haney, uh, out at Pack Fleet in Hawaii, who's having much better weather, I'm sure, than we are here today on this coast. But uh, we get, Cecil and I are, are attached to HIP uh, in making the fleet a better place, uh, getting ready. Uh, our lines of operation are the same. And we really want to take, uh, uh, and we mean it when we say two fleets, one voice, that we speak together. Uh, I don't send an email to the Chief of Naval Operations, or Cecil doesn't, that uh, the other one of us isn't on the, uh, is on the two line, uh, so that he gets a common fleet perspective. And our staffs are attached at the hip as well. Um, you know, it's really important. Sea Lords, uh, uh, well done. You only made uh, four articles in the early bird. In the, in the, so thanks for taking the heat off me there, shipmate. Um, <laughs> But you know, the surface Navy creates 70% of our forward presence. I'm sure you covered that. Uh, and, uh, he's, and, and the Sea Lord's uh, always uh, uh, quick to remind me that it's only 20, 26% of the Navy budget. I challenge that math, but uh, um, uh, I'm not going to, since I'm a history major and you're not, I'm not going to take you on on that one. But about 30, the most important thing, about 30% of our surface Navy is deployed on any given day. Uh, and that's, uh, that is a, we're going to talk about the importance of that here in a second. Um, we've had some challenges in the past. We're going to talk about some of the challenges we've had in the past. We're going to talk about with every challenge comes opportunities, and we're going to talk about the opportunities uh, that are out there and the great work that the community is putting in place uh, to, to take advantage of those opportunities. And it's going to take all of us. It's going to take a collective we. It's not just going to take the, the it's going to take all of the naval officers in the Navy uh, from all of the different communities pulling together, working together, making the tough decisions. Balancing off risk versus gain, uh, making those tough choices for the best thing for our Navy, which is the best thing for our nation. And that brings me, uh, what, what, what does the future hold for us? And if we could go to the, to the next slide, please. Many of you have seen this slide before. Um, but I think it's important that we talk about this slide. Darn. Um, uh, because there's, there's some dynamics that are pulling at us on the four corners strategic operational in the upper left, some economic financial in the right. 
um, political, cultural in the left, and it cares how do we manage our workforce. And everybody in this room and our surface Navy and our Navy is right smack in the middle of that in the, we seem to have, did Spa War give me this light then? There we go. Okay, so right there in the center, I couldn't help, I couldn't help myself. Um, right there in the center is, is, uh, is where we are. And let's talk a little bit about the strategic and the operational and what does our future hold. We're out of Iraq, okay? We're, uh, we're, there's no question uh, that we're coming out of Afghanistan, okay? We're going through a pretty darn long spring in the, uh, in the Middle East, Arab Spring. It's going on two years about now. Uh, we have a new uh, strategic guidance document that's going to talk about our shift to the Pacific, of which I think the single most important part of that shift is the intellectual shift uh, to the Pacific on that. And we don't know what our future is going to hold. Um, uh, so what does that portend for our Navy and our Marine Corps and our naval forces in this next decade? And before we talk about the next decade, let's talk about the last decade. The last decade at combat, in combat for over 12 years, okay? Uh, in combat before we recognize we are in combat. And uh, uh, when you look at our, our uh, the effect that that has had is on our armed forces and within our Navy and our Marine Corps, you think about it, 04 and below, E6, E7 and below, uh, that's all they know. They volunteered uh, to raise their hand and put on the cloth of their nation to serve their nation in time of war. Less than 1% of America has done that, and I'd like to have you all give a big round of applause to the 1% that did that. But what does our future hold? Where are we going to be? Are we going to are we going to follow through on our strategy beyond the intellectual shift and shift our physical presence to the Pacific? Where are we going to be? And I, quite frankly, can't tell you where we're going to be location-wise, but I can tell you the conditions that we're, where we're going to be into the future is, is we're going to sail to crisis. There's going to be uncertainty out there, and the naval force over the next decade, the Navy and the Marine Corps team, will be sailing to crisis because that's what we've done since we were founded. That's what we will continue to do. And as you look at the dynamics that are out there around the world, there'll be a lot of crisis for us to do. Business is going to be good if that's your business model, is to respond to crisis. The reason we're going to respond to crisis is because we're already there. We're going to be forward deployed like we've been forward deployed since the beginning of World War II. Okay? We will continue to be forward deployed. 30 to 35 percent of our, armed, of our Navy and Marine Corps will be forward deployed rotationally. All right? That's going to be great demands. And we'll be in great demand when we get there because when we get there, when we sail to crisis, we provide a capability that is unique to the armed forces of the United States of America. We bring our own physical and political access. It's as simple as that. So we can get offshore with our own physical and political access, provide, provide options to the National Command Authority to help settle a crisis, or if it goes to the next level, we, bear, we bring relative combat power to bear on that particular crisis, and we can follow through. We're the enabler. We can open battle space. We can hold battle space to bring other forces in. And that's why this next decade is going to be really critical for us, and our demand signal is going to continue to go up. Even as heavily stressed as we've been in the last 10 to 12 years, it's going to go up because our demand signal to respond to crisis, given the dynamics out there, are going to continue to be there. Let's talk about China. We're, going to, we're trying to bring, and I think doing a fairly good job, of bringing China and a responsible part of, in, into, a, into a world power in here. But as we do that, I think it's important to recognize, or any history majors out there, have we ever been successful in that in the past? Anybody? I'll take your silence as, no, we've never been successful in the past. Uh, we haven't been, but that doesn't mean we can't be successful this time. But we do recognize that, uh, uh, that, there are, that there are challenges out there. And you just have to look at the dynamics in the Pacific out there as the nations that share those same waters, uh, that, uh, that are all share in international waters. There's going to be challenges out there with China. And we have to keep an eye on that. Let's shift over to the good news in the upper right-hand corner. <laughs> The most, the hardest, the hardest part of the next decade 
is confronting such a change from the last decade. For the last 10 years, the Department of Defense has been flush with cash. Now, did we feel like we were flush with cash? No, well, we probably didn't. But, it, but reality was we were flush with cash. We were at war, and between base and the operational cost of war, we, could, uh, we had plenty of money, okay? Um, we've never had enough money, right? But uh, we've had plenty of money to do our job, okay? It's not going to be that way over the next 10 years. History shows us that coming out of every major conflict, there's a 27 to 32 product, 32 percent reduction in the DOD budget, and this goes all the way back to the Revolutionary War. And yes, I know there wasn't a DOD back then, but the math still works out, all right? With the Budget Control Act of last year, it works out to be about a 10 to 12 percent reduction, depending upon how sharp your pencil is when you look at that. And that was a $487 billion reduction over 10 years. And, and to be honest, that wasn't real hard to accept, okay? So I say in the future, we're going to see that decline and we're going to see another, uh, some more significant cuts. That's no surprise. And what is the form of those cuts going to be? It could be in another Budget Control Act, it could come in sequestration, or it could come in little ankle biters every single year. And in my mind, that is the worst case scenario, uh, is the little ankle biters, because really what I need is a number, what we need is a number so that we can uh, make decisions and we can do proper programming and we can make the right choices and then give to the, to the strength of our nation, which is to industry, a predictable funding line that they can turn out the best value for the American taxpayers that we can then employ, all right? But it's going to be a very different time. And where it's important is, is in the last 10 years, we need to go out as we look forward, we need to challenge the fiscal assumptions that any of our programs or any of the ways that we are operated uh, were based on in the last 10 years. Because it's a new fiscal environment. Case in point, can we afford the LCS Manning construct in the next future? We have to challenge those assumptions. Those are important issues, and that's what we do, and we try and challenge the staff to challenge those assumptions. Any good deliberate plan, you always go back and challenge your assumptions because, Rick, what happens if your assumptions fall short? Your plan falls apart, okay? And we need to challenge those fiscal assumptions as we look forward. Let's talk about the lower left-hand corner. The election's over, right? And therefore, all is good here in Washington, D.C., right? It's no different than it's ever been. There's going to be a debate, political science major as well. We have a huge debate inside of our country. I'm not here to talk about that. And we're going to be affected by that uh, as our nation's leadership decides how and where we're going to be in the future as a nation, okay? It's a democracy. It's not always pretty. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else, and I'm glad we're having the debate out there. And then as we look in the lower right-hand corner, we look at the demographics, we look at our workforce. And those two on the right side are really important, okay? Because although we're going to see a decline in our budget over the next 10 years, it is a sine wave. And that number is going to go back up again, all right? We won't get into a trough and stay into a trough forever. The nation will need us again, and they're going to increase the DOD budget. You can see that over history. That's what's going to occur, all right? The question is, the tough choices that we have to make as we're in the downward trend to where we get in the upward trend, okay? If we give up capability, will we have that capability on the other side? Will we have the intellectual industrial base to capitalize? Will we have the experimentation, the S&T out there, to capitalize when times get better, okay? Right now, we, have a, we don't have a retention problem. When the economy will get better, and the economy will get better, just don't ask me when, okay? We're gonna have retention problems. We don't have a recruiting problem right now. We will have a recruiting problem. So the decisions we need to make today when we don't have a problem, we need to make sure we make the right decisions, recognizing that we're going to have to live with those decisions when things get better. It will, it will be a different time. And it's in no different than our predecessors were in. But we're right smack into the center of that. And uh, we're going to have to deal with all of those issues. OK? Slide, please. Professional development. Don't talk to a group without putting the CNO sailing directions up. Okay? Health warning, all right? All right, not much of a response. Okay, I'll work on it. Why do I like the sailing directions? One, what the CNO finds interesting, we find fascinating, right? Okay? I'm a fleet sailor. Okay? 
And those sailing directions are about today's Navy. Today's Navy. Right? War fighting first. Forward. Being ready. Those are sure good and powerful words. Okay? And as the Fleet Forces Command commander who is responsible for readiness today, those words are music to my ears. All right? Now, the problem is, how do I operationalize those six words? Okay? How can we operationalize so that we are warfighting first, forward, ready? All right? um, and we've got some challenges out there. But our goal is to operationalize his intent. It's very clear, and that's what we're doing. Slide, please. Let's have a discussion about wholeness. And the first thing you need to realize is on the top slide, it's a goal to prevent hollowness. It's not an end state. Because quite frankly, we can't define what wholeness means. We can't define it among the services. If you just look at how the Army and the Navy produce readiness, the way we produce readiness is hollow to the Air Force and the Marine Corps. They have an FRP cycle, the Army does, just like we do. It is a cyclic readiness level that you intend to come back off a of deployment, have a low level of readiness, and then build it back over time, which is a completely different model than the Air Force and the, and the Marine Corps, which is a constant level of readiness. Very expensive, but that's what, they, that's what they, uh, their model demands, not us. All right. So now with that and the puts and takes from the slides that we were talking about, the demands that are going to be out there in the next future, in the future over the next 10 years, the fiscal reality that's going to be out there over the next 10 years, the political reality that's going to be out there, and the cultural and dynamics, then how are we going to work our way through here and not hollow ourselves out? Because it's easy to say we're going to be whole. It's really hard to make the tough choices to not be hollow. All right. So I'd like to talk about this, and we're going to go through one by one on how do we think we're doing right now. Let's just take a snapshot in time today on the 16th. Today's the 16th, right? It's today's 16th. 16th of January, 2013. How are we doing? Do we have the necessary numbers of ships, aircraft, and forces with the required capabilities to do the mission today and in the future? Work with me, crowd. What's that? What's our future going to hold? What do we think the future is going to be hold? Do we have the necessary number of ships? This is important, because what did the Sea Lord talk about yesterday? Are we carrying too much end strength in order to do the mission? Right? Do we have too much stuff okay, to support, to do the particular mission? Can we? Let's just ask this one. How many people? Do you think we can ever meet the demand signal of the combatant commanders? No, oh, of course we can. All right? All right? So, um, uh, the question is, do we have the right number with the right balance, and then do we have the right number that we can sustain over the long haul? Man, qualified, motivated personnel that are trained, proficient, and confident. How are we doing there? Got them, but in the wrong place. We're going to talk about that. Let me talk about motivation. It's so great being back in the fleet, all right? All you got to do is walk on board one of our ships, get, get on board one of our squadrons, go on out to Little Creek, see some of the battalions. You just got to see the youth of America, be with the youth of America. America is giving us their very best. They are very, very highly motivated, okay? We've got to make sure that they're qualified. We've got to give them the training. We've got to give them the proficiency. We've got to give them the confidence because without the training and the proficiency, they won't have the confidence in order to do there. The one thing they're not lacking right now is motivation, okay? And we gotta give it to them. All right, properly maintained platforms that are capable of performing to the design standard and reaching the expected service life. Chairman's got us marching into the Joint Force 2020. 20, 80 percent of the Navy that we're going to have in 2020, we already own. 80% of it. It's already there. Okay? So in 2020, we've got to make sure that it's relevant, that it's, that it's maintained, it can do its mission, 
that we modernize correctly, and if it can't, we make the necessary puts and takes to do the recapitalization. That's the debate out here, modernization and recapitalization and declining resources. What's good enough getting us to the next point in that sign curve, the increase in the sign curve that we get out there? But we've got to maintain what we own, because 80 percent, 80 percent of the future Navy is what we already know. What we already know. Sea Lord, the CNO's project for you, how far out did he have you look? 2025, okay, and that is only 12 years away from now. Where were we 12 years ago? How long does it take to fundamentally change the, the shape of our Navy? When was today's Navy really designed? Hmm? It's about a 25, 30 year program, okay? All right, so in case of my community, uh, naval aviation was shaped in 1991 coming out of the uh, Cold War when every single type model series, series was going to be recapitalized, not once but twice, okay? And all of them except for F-18s, E-2 Hawkeyes, and H-60s were canceled. That was it. Everything else was canceled by OSD, and that's the air wing of today. And it was decided in 1991. It wasn't decided by us. It saved us, and we're going to talk about why, that was, why it's important. Tools, spares, repair parts to maintain the material readiness. You got to have the parts in order to get them to 80 per, uh, to get them to get that 80 percent to where we needed to go. Okay, we have to have the hap we have to have the right depth out there at the right time. So we just push we're pushing out um, Harry S Truman in Comp 2X, full up Comp 2X, and the Cure Sarge for its Comp 2X. And we're adjusting their spares to make sure that they don't miss a training opportunity. We've given them the range and depth that they need. But we're also plussing them up in some key areas so they don't miss that training opportunity. If there's an ADEX, they're going to need to have that ADEX, and everything's got to work. They can't accept to have a part not work because we've invested so much in the training aids in order to get there. So it's identifying not only what you need day to day, it's what you're going to need for the event that you're getting ready to execute. And then you need the right tools. Okay? I don't go, I don't get my car repaired on until I walk into the garage and take a look at the garage. How does it look? Okay, is it a neat garage? What type of cars are being in there? What do their tools look like? You know, I mean, that's a mechanic, a good mechanic. It's the same thing. We got to give our sailors the right tools in order to do their job. And you got to have the right ordinance. It's all about putting the warhead on the forehead, where it's a pack, whether it's a packet of information, a TLAM or a JDAM, or a 5 inch 54, you gotta, we got to be able to hit the right amount of ordinance out there. And where's our, where's our requirements, people? Our N889 out there, raise your hand. What's the first thing you go to? What's the first thing you steal? You cut down on the ordinance accounts, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, but sometimes that's the right choice. I mean, we put, uh, in the case of my community, we put AMRAM, we, we cut it. But quite frankly, if we had bought out AMRAM when we first bought it, we'd have a bunch of obsolete weapons right now. So you do want to buy it at the right level so that your warheads, you can modernize those particular warheads. And the most overlooked, one of the most overlooked is our shore infrastructure to support the warfighting forces and our sailors and our family. I'm really concerned uh, with CNIC that we undervalue the importance of Naval Installations Command in the production of warfighting, okay? Which is not only warfighting, production of readiness, it's taking care of the sailors and taking care of our families. Can't be the first bill payer. It underpins everything we do, okay? So now I'm looking for a yes or no answer to this next question. That's all I'm looking for, so you all can all participate. Is our current effort both effective and affordable? No. Don't even I get a hua out of somebody on this one? <laughs> all right, no, it's not a, it is not, okay? It isn't effective in our last 10 years when we were flush with cash, hard to believe we were flush with cash. In the future, it's not, it's not gonna be effective or affordable as well. And so then the question is, is there a better way of doing business, okay? Is there a better way to get her done? Slide, please. I'm a firm believer that every commander owns battle space, and every commander needs to have a theory of that battle space, okay? Um, in my job at Fleet Forces Command, our battle space is the production of warriors and the production of, of readiness. It's training and the production of readiness. Warriors that know how to use the hardware that they're, that they're given. And so we're calling our, our battle space the readiness kill chain, okay? the readiness kill chain, and it encompasses the entire Navy here, all right? But I want you to go down to little blocks on the bottom of this particular slide, 
because it's really important that you understand the, one, we understand kill chains. We like kill chains. We know that if we want to achieve a, an effect, there's cer certain thing. We want to achieve this effect, there's a certain activity that we have to occur either sequentially or at least get her done to be able to put that warhead on a forehead. All right? But if you have a break in that kill chain and you don't recognize you have a break in that kill chain, you are not going to produce the effect you're looking for. It's okay if you recognize it and you go back and you plug up that seam and get what you need, but there's stuff that you have to occur in here in order to, to hit that, to get that effect, all right? So our kill chain, that effect that we're looking for is the production of warriors in readiness, and we need to build, we need to put in the right order uh, with the, and, and make it all happen, put the right pieces in place to produce, that, produce those warriors and produce the readiness that we're looking for, okay? In our business, in this readiness kill chain, you are either a producer of readiness, you are a consumer of readiness, or you're the product itself, okay? Now, I, I'm here to tell you, it's the most fun to be the product, okay? It's the next most fun to be a consumer of readiness, and it's the least fun to be the producer of readiness, all right? But, well, quite frankly, they're all fun at my point, all right? But at some point, the product is also a producer. Now, go back in your, your career, when you're in the fleet, and um, at what point you were a product, at what point did you have self-awareness that you were also part of the production effort? Rick, I'm going to pick on you because you just happened to be in the front row. Okay, he, he, he's full of shit. And, um, <laughs> I was going to challenge if you said when you were the, my Desron, um, but uh, uh, I think somewhere as a lieutenant, lieutenant commander, when you finally realize that you pull your head up out of your wardroom, you realize you're just surviving, that you're, you're part of the process in producing, producing uh, readiness. Okay? And I love you, Rick. I love you. You know that. The, um, uh, in, a, in the Rubik's Cube, in the right-hand corner, though, is, uh, is really all the elements of putting together the readiness kill chain. First off is the top of the, top of the cube, which are, I'm going to call, which are the weapon, is the weapon system. The weapon system is not your Arleigh Burke. The weapon system is not your FNA-18. It's not your Virginia-class submarine. It's a compilation of all the submarines, the, all the airplanes, the ships, the expeditionary battalions, the, our, our cyber warriors, and the staffs that fight those individual elements. That is the weapon system. That's the weapon system. Unfortunately, we, buy, we come from stovepipe communities, and then within, our, within those communities, which are tribes, we have sub-tribes, right? And we think our sub-tribe and our platform, my F-18, or your Arleigh Burke, or the Virginia, it's the only thing in the world out there, and that's just not the case. It is an element of the weapon system, and it's the compilation of all of those elements. The, as important as any of them are the staffs that put that and figure out how to fight it, is that weapon system, okay? The elements of, the, of readiness, or the elements of that uh, are on the right-hand side. It's the personnel, equipment, the supply, I gotta get to where I can read, the training, the ordinance, the installations, the networks, and it's community and industry. Some of them call them our pesto pillars, but what isn't in there is that uh, we don't talk about installations, networks, and the community and in industry. We've added them as we were digging into what, are the, what goes into making up our readiness kill chain. What goes into making warriors and readiness? The networks are a key piece, the installations, industry, and our community are key partners in this and they need to know it. So when I talk to them, I'm, when I talk to industry here, and when I talk to, to our government leadership, our political leadership, they are part of our kill chain, okay? We gotta understand and influence all the factors in the production of readiness, and a key point here then is if we understand it, it gives us the ability to know where there are options, and where we can accept risk, and where we cannot accept risk. Okay? Because we're going to accept risk in the future. We want to make sure, though, it's an informed decision, and it's through this kill chain that we're going to do that. Slide, please. The next thing we need to understand, how many people are, have been to staff colleges or war colleges here? Raise your hand. 
How many people got higher than a B? Raise your hand. Good, good. I kept a lid on my coffee and I didn't plagiarize. They gave me a B and a master's at the Navy War College. Ends, ways, and means. All too frequently, we don't understand ends, ways, and means. And in the production of readiness in a ready skill chain, we really need to figure this out. What goes where? And it all starts at the ends. Where do we want to be? What is our strategic outcome? What is the end state that we're looking for here? That's the most important thing you got to decide before you go do anything. What is it that you want to get done? For what purpose? The ways, simple, it's the methods, the TTPs, the strategies to get there, to where you want to go. All right? Because once you figure it out, you got to figure out, okay, now that I know where I want to go, how am I going to get there? And then it comes down to the means, what am I going to need to get there? What are the resources that I'm going to need? Okay? Troops, weapon systems, money, political. What is our will to get there? Okay? And how much time do I have to get there? Ends, ways, and means. It's really, in the bottom block, it's how we balance. Really, fundamentally, you get what you pay for at the end of the day, okay? And, it's a, and you, if you use this process, you're gonna understand what you're gonna get for what you're willing to pay, all right? So we put all that together, slide please. The single busiest slide in Washington, D.C. today. And we're gonna pass out an e-board card to this, and we're trying to explain the readiness kill chain to Dick and Jane. We're gonna start at the top. What is our ends? It's our deployability and our sustainment model of the FRP. In CNO's war, uh, tenets, it is forward. It's forward deployed and our sustainability model. That's where we want to be, to be forward. The ways, how we're going to get there, and the means, personnel, equipment, supplies, training, installations, network, ordinance, community, and industry, okay? For me, in his tenets, that's being ready, okay? And then war fighting first is the weapon system that we talk about over here, surface aviation submarines, our cyber, NECC, and our operational and our tactical headquarters staffs, okay? That tell the ships, the airplanes, and the battalions where they need to go and why they need to get there, all right? Within the FRP, only the deployability model is the ends. Our training model of maintenance, basic, and integrated in the FRP are just ways to get there, sequential ways to get there. But when you go all the way back into the kill chain, we have to resource our policy, define requirements, assess the people, do introductory training before they get to the fleet. All right? That's the left side of the kill chain and the right side of the kill chain's over here. At, fleet, at CPAC Fleet and FFC, our dominant line, our primary focus area is the, left, uh, is the right side of this kill chain. There's some introductory training that we're responsible for, but at the end of the day, it's introductory training and then putting the band together, putting the weapon system together through the FRTP and sustaining them on deployment. OPNAV, predominantly focuses on the left side of the kill chain. Sure, we pay attention of the other side, but at the end of the day, we need better visibility of throughout the kill chain. Because I'm here to tell you, in the challenges in the production of readiness, I look at root cause. If I'm having a problem, I look at root cause. And many of the issues that I have in root cause are on the left side of my kill chain, left side of this kill chain. Okay, if I look at manpower challenges out there, it's left side of the kill chain, all right? In the case of people, the kill chain starts with defining how many people we want. And then we have to recruit them. Then we have to do introductory boot camp, introductory training, commissioning source training. Then we want to give them pipeline training for wherever they happen to go to get them to their unit, to get them into their, weapon, to get them into their platform that's over here. As we looked at who pays attention to what, 
in the kill chain. The CISCOMs do a pretty good job of paying attention throughout from birth to the accession piece, uh, to the assessing piece. CISCOMs are very, very involved in this. But everybody needs to be fully involved, and we need horizontal and vertical synchronization integration communication paths of where you fit in the kill chain. There's common actions that we need to, we need to, we need to capitalize on. There's co common training opportunities that we need to capitalize on. And then when we pull them together in the fleet, there's opportunities that we're missing so that when we put the full band together in its integrated phase of training, we maximize the effect. We get the maximum amount of readiness for the cost that we put into it. Okay? Everybody in the Navy is a part of this kill chain. And we want everybody in the Navy and industry to know that they're a part of this kill chain. So that if they want to change a widget in something, they need to say, how's this going to affect the kill chain? If I want to change this policy, how's this going to affect the fleet? Or on this side, if I want to change the manning construct in the fleet, can the left side of the kill chain produce it? It's the left side talking to the right side. And the CNOs put Fleet Forces Command in a supported relationship with uh, the CISCOMs, with all of the uh, CNIC, with all of the NHEADS, to, be, to work with PAC Fleet to help answer that question. Not to make decisions, but when that widget maker out there, widget maker and an Arleigh Burke, says, I want to change the production ratio of widgets, and he wants to understand the impact on the kill chain, they can come to Fleet Forces Command, and through our process, we'll go to the Sea Lord, who's digging into that, and we can give an informed decision. We can make an informed recommendation to the CNO, who's the ultimate decision maker. That's why he gets his pictures on the bulkheads, right, to make those tough decisions. Because if it's Cecil's and my decision to make, we'll make that decision. But if it's a hard decision, and, it, and it's going to have it's going to be into that put uh, gain versus return, risk versus gain, give up one capability for another capability. We want to have that informed decision, and that's what we do here. Now, what uh, Cecil and I have done is put the, um, each one of the community leads to develop an as-is and a 2B kill chain for two of their a minimum of two of their type model series. So the Sea Lord is doing uh, LCS, and, and then we've added all of the amphib force to that. And the first thing they're doing is defining the as-is kill chain for those weapon systems. And then with an unconstrained resource, the next step will be to um, brief their 2B. What would they like it to be? And between where we are and where we want to get, we'll be able to identify the barriers, we'll identify what we don't have, and we can have an informed discussion about what are the risks versus gains, what are the trade-offs we need um, in, in order to get to where we want to go, in order to support the ends of that model here. And the Sea Lord will be briefing me out next week, right? First week in February on, uh, on his first effort. And I first took the first two um, uh, as his briefs, both from uh, Buzz at uh, MSC yesterday, uh, Friday and also uh, from our METOC command. Okay? Aviation's doing F-18, uh, growlers, I mean, are doing growlers. And they're also doing JSF. Um, the uh, submarine community is doing uh, the fast attack. It turns out that LA class and Virginia class are very similar. And we're also having them do the SSBN. Why am I having them doing the SSBN? Anybody want to know? It's the most effective crew swap model that we have. With what kind of checkbook there, Mick Pond? Yeah, unlimited checkbook. Yeah, you can develop a great model if you got all the money in the world. I just rode up here with Mike Connors, and he goes, I don't have all the money in the world. Yeah, well, yeah. He's got more than 26%, right? Yeah, okay. All right. Um, so I'm, everybody in here is a part of that, part of this readiness kill chain. And I'm asking you, where are you in that kill chain? Where are you in that kill chain? And your actions affects the ends. So come forward when you want to make a decision. Okay? Slide. All right, what are some of the challenges that are out there? It's not bad to know what your challenges are, all right? 
I mean, I wake up every morning and my challenge is I have to come to grips that I'm not going to play in the NBA, right? I've come to accept it just last week. But we have maintenance, manning, and some training challenges out there in the surface community that we've made at multiple levels, at the S1, S2, S3, S4, and S5 level that have magnified over time. That is, that is where we are today, all right? The, uh, but the kill chain goes through all this, and I'm just going to use an example, and we'll start with the lower left-hand corner with maintenance. If we decide to underfund maintenance, because we underfunded maintenance, and we chose to not look at things like tanks, okay, for how many years? 10 or 12 years, all right? When we start looking at them, we're going to find stuff. You know, we're going to lift up that rock and go, whoo, that's not very pretty, right? But if we decide to underfund maintenance, there's some things that have to be done. So where does that work have to get done? The crew's going to have to do them in the case of ships. So it goes up to the manning. At the same time, at S1, S2, S3, S4, we made some manning decisions that didn't pan out. For whatever reason, some of, them, some of the assumptions that we built those on, we didn't go out and challenge them and they didn't work out, but the work level on the ship went up. Okay? If we look at the training, we decided to do away with some training. We tried to look at some revolution in training that wasn't quite, most revolutions aren't successful, by the way. I'm just going to here to tell you, all right? That didn't quite pan out, but we did away with training. How many of your top readiness degraders did you, that slide you showed me, what was it? Ten, eight of your 10 readiness degraders, we've done away with the C schools for that? About that? Yeah. Today, eight of his 10 readiness degraders, we did away over the last eight years, the C schools, to train sailors on what to look for. So they don't know what right looks like. It isn't because they're not great people. It isn't because they're properly motivated. We just haven't given them the training that they need to recognize and teach them where the standards are. It's, it's, it's not rocket science. So those are all things, and those can divert us from the upper right-hand corner, which is our recapitalization piece, which we're gonna do. We're gonna recapitalize 20% of our force we can't take our eye off the ball of bringing LPD-17, LCS, and DDG-1000 online for these communities, okay, who have their own individual kill chains, all right? But those are the challenges out there. Now, I'm here to tell you, I'm pretty, despite the early bird articles from the Sea Lord, I feel pretty good about where we're headed in the future with the surface Navy. Slide, please. Okay? Now. We're going to go into, I won't give you any of the specifics because I have to put on my glasses to read those notes, but the big ones are we're fully funding the availabilities, not quite to the level, I guess, okay, we're semi-full, uh, almost fully funding the availabilities. We're going back into our tank and voids again, okay, and we've got the surf map program, all right? Now, have we seen the results of this effort yet? No, be real honest. We've invested in it. Right now, um, many of those availabilities as a result of the upper right-hand corner and lower left-hand corner of my first slide are at risk. And we're terrified about that because we're going back in and doing work that we need to get done in order to get our classes, classes of ship to reach their design life, all right? We need to now follow through. We are putting in place the processes and the funding and the procedures that we need to, to get where we want to go. So we need to defend them. So you and OpNav over here, especially you, you green eye shade dudes and dudettes that want to steal all of our money, you need to make sure we continue to uh, fund, those, fund those things that we've, that we've put in place. When we look at our sailors, our nation's greatest, um, our single greatest asset are our people, okay? And we're putting in place the schooling and the training necessary so that when they get to their ship, they know what right looks like. Now, they're still going to need experience, but they need the foundation before they get on the ship, or they need the refresher training on the ship in order to then build on that experience that they're going to get at sea. We need to give them the tools. And we need to buy the schoolhouses back. And we have bought the schoolhouses back on the waterfront in order to teach them what right looks like, okay? There is progress. I will tell you, I, I think significant progress uh, that the Sea Lord has put in place and his predecessor, Rick, has put in place 
um, and the community has put in place, but it is very fragile. And those aren't my words. Those are Sea Lord's and his shipmate Dave Thomas's words to me when I came into this job. It's fragile. So my job is to shore that up and provide supporting fires so that the stuff that we put in place we can capitalize on. Slides, please. I'm going to spend some time on this one because I think this is the most, one of the most remarkable turnarounds I've seen in your community. And that is a surface warfare officer training continuum. It is a training continuum. All right? It starts at the left-hand corner with basic SWO, basic officer uh, indoctrination course, which we just graduated about a month ago, right? The first two courses from each fleet concentration center in San Diego and Norfolk that teaches our young potential surface warfare officers what right looks like. What are the basic blocking and tackling skills that they're going to need when they get on board their ship? Okay? It's a phenomenal program. We then take them into some uh, first tour division officer courses to give them specialized training. And you can see from TLAM, um, uh, comms, legal officer, uh, ammo, admin, things of that nature. There's a gap underneath that that we need to fill in, put in some more training, some more pipeline training some for those other critical skill sets. I didn't go learn how to fly the A7 when I was an ensign without understanding how the engine worked, how the hydraulics worked, how the electrical worked. I, I'd learned all that. We moved fluids. We, were chain, we had to do hands-on practical application, and we need to do that, and we need to fill that void in, but we have a place to fill it in. We know we have a place to do it, and then they go into their division officer tour to fill those critical skill sets and lead our sailors at a very junior age. From there, they're going into their second division officer course. And when I was just up at SWAS about a month ago, uh, I was really blown away with uh, the, the, how far the curriculum has come. So we have a second division officer uh, tour in there right now. And the first words I asked the SWAS, uh, SWAS uh, uh, head of SWAS up there uh, was, how quickly can we accelerate the new SWAS course, and he goes, I don't want to. I have it palmed for two years from now because it's designed to build on the, the BDOC course, which we've just graduated, the experience here to then go to a new division officer course that uh, it has been palmed and the curriculum is being developed to build on this training continuum so that this is the foundation for that schoolhouse, for those skill sets. That's just like my model from my community. And my model works. Whoever designed my model knew what they were doing. Okay? In there, the Sea Lords come up with the billets for patch wearers, for WTIs, for experts. And this was a, a revolution in naval aviation for us when we came up with our patch wearer concept that we have today. And the single hardest part that we had with that was not de developing the idea. It was coming up with the manpower to do it. Okay? And the Sea Lord's already figured out how to do it for not one, but for two per ship. And the first ones we're going in there is for our ASW watch WTI, ASW officer WTI course. And so here's, here's course, here are advanced schooling to prepare them for their second division officer tour and have somebody up there key in ASW and the next step, of course, is for our defenders, right? And, uh, and they, he's identified the method in order to buy the manpower in order to do it. Now it's just simple course curriculum in order to do it and give them the supporting fires and the schoolhouse is in there. From there, selection for department head, uh, uh, basic department head training, and then if they're going to Aegis to deal with the um, one or two baselines that we have out there uh, into, 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 the, into our Aegis force. And then it goes on down here, it's a continuum to build into the department head training, the skills that they're going to need in the um, post-department head, the PCO, the P PXO course, to then uh, finish up a great command tour afloat as an 05 command, greatest command you'll ever have, and then preparing them for major command, a major command pipeline, and then into major command. It's a continuum that goes, that, that here ends in, depart in major department head that starts back here. It's not all about experience. It's about the proper training in the right sequence to, the, to build upon the training you're going to get at, uh, at, at sea, preparing you for your first command tour, which is preparation for your major command tour. 
And my hat's off to you, Sea Lord, and you and your team for putting this in place. I can't wait to see this fully flush out. When those first ensigns that graduated from BDOC a month ago, the kind of leaders, they're going to be there. It's going to be awesome. Okay? Slide, please. So, the value of the kill chain improves production performance, cost expenditures, and the single most important thing, aligns unity of effort across the enterprise to make the necessary puts and takes, the decisions on the puts and takes for the tough decisions as we're going to be confronted out there in the future. Okay? We want to set the conditions for the new capabilities, the new platforms are capable, uh, the new platforms that are coming, and the new capabilities are out there. And one of the most the ones I'm most excited about is the railgun, because you promised it to me five years ago, and I'm still waiting for it. All right. But because we're going to be in a fiscally constrained environment, we need to have a process in place that looks at this, and we have a process in place that we have are putting in place to help us make those tough decisions, make the decisions that we can at our level, make the informed recommendations to the Chief of Naval Operations for him. Slide, please. What's your role? This is on the back of your kneeboard card that you'll be handed out. If you're a producer up in OpNav and Syscoms, those of you in OpNav, it's great being in the fleet. Get over it. You're not there. If you're industry, you are a key partner. You are a key partner. You are a valued partner. We know the uncertainties that we are being confronted with today are nothing compared to the uncertainties that, uh, that you all are facing right now. Okay? And uh, finally, in the fleet, where we're all three, we've got to put it all together. Slide, please. And with that, I've talked long enough. I'll now take your questions. Free shot at a four-star. Admiral Tom Rudin, sir, uh, United States Director of Service Warfare Division, OpNav staff, a producer. <laughs> um, a couple questions for you, sir. Um, and, and first of all, uh, I sincerely appreciate A, you taking the time to come up here and speak to us. B, going through the readiness kill chain, you added clarity to me, and I sincerely, sincerely appreciate that. Um, certainly been working with the Sea Lord on that. Um, third, uh, your depth of knowledge on the path that we take to produce commanding officers, I got to start studying it for the aviators because very impressive, sir, that you're in it that deep. I, I, I sincerely appreciate that. Um, looking at the readiness kill chain, I, I have a question and I'm focusing on the weapon systems because as a producer, and I look at the pillars of excellence, I say, okay, I got it. But I came here from a carrier strength and in that job, I viewed the weapon system as the forces that we deploy together. And so I was wondering if you could give us insight into why you made the decision to parse the weapon systems in this fashion, as opposed to, say, parse them as a carrier strike group, an amphibious strike group, uh, deploying SSN on a, on a mission, or a BMD, or a BMD deployer. I don't know. <laughs> Next question, please. <laughs> I love my job. <laughs> I think, if, pull, pull it up. Pull up the uh, kill chain. Because um, we're raised in tribes. And if we want to go after and get the answer to um, uh, the tribes have to figure out within their, within their, within their piece. So uh, I don't have, I can't go to, I mean, there's not a carrier strike group community to figure out the carrier strike group. But I do have a sea lord who can figure out the ship part of that. And, and I'm really glad you asked this question because it's fleet forces and Pat Fleet's job to do the pulling it all together piece. So um, uh, where um, I have all the communities working on their as is a 2B of two or more of their type model series within their community, the, the fleet forces command staff is pulling together that effort, if that makes sense to answer your particular question. Okay. Thanks. Uh, second question. Oh. 
Um, I relined up their staff, N9, N96. I pull in maintenance manpower training. And, uh, I, and I, I really appreciate your How's time. How's that going for you? <laughs> We're working it hard, sir. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so my question is this. As I, as I look back now, and I, am, and I, I have gotten in deeply into understanding the situation that you described vis-a-vis -vis the maintenance that we, that we haven't executed on our ships, the backlog that we built, understanding the depth of that backlog and how to get out of it. And so, and so my question is this, as I look at, and, 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 and being a nuke, I have the benefit of being a reactor officer and understanding the execution of nuclear maintenance and the funding of that particular side of the house. Different than the way we fund surface ship maintenance, I'm granted they're executed in the public yard and, and we execute in the private yards. But I'm wondering as we go forward to ensure that we lock in the funding in order to execute this maintenance. If you would advocate a, some sort of a situation where we pass the BSO down to the TICOMs so that as, as, as N96's works to fully fund those maintenance availabilities, we have insurance that in fact we're going to go execute those maintenance availabilities. I need to look at that. I'll be real honest, I need to look at that. You know, um, if I was at the Bubblehead Commission, um, they beat me up because we put their maintenance at risk because we put prioritized carriers over them. So they would probably want that same sort of thing. Uh, uh, and I don't get a very good return on that swap of people. You know, in that particular environment, as you as you know very well. Um, so let me let me let me go look at that. Okay, be careful what you ask for. And uh, <laughs> uh, let let me go look at that. I'll give you that one. And so the two of them, they've got a tasker up here. Congratulations. And, uh, <laughs> but but I do want to answer your question with a statement that may not be what you asked. Uh, but the importance of, of uh, first identifying a class maintenance plan, okay, and what goes into that class maintenance plan, and then uh, identifying uh, what uh, the availabilities in order to do it, to scope those availabilities correctly, and then fund those availabilities correctly, and then get that ship out back out on time is is absolutely critical. And my hat's off to um, Kevin McCoy. Is Kevin here today? Has he come and talk to you? Is Kevin McCoy and his team uh, in going down the right path um, in order to put that process in place of, of the maintenance plans and then working uh, uh, to scope the availabilities correctly, working with our partners that are out in this audience today to scope, that, scope those availabilities correctly, and then it's my job to find them correctly. I'm committed to not give you. How many people other than uh, Tom, Steve Tomaszewski and myself were on Kennedy with us? Anybody out there? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I'm not gonna Kennedy the fool. Okay, not gonna do that. What we, by not funding her availabilities correctly over a period of a decade, we paid that price. And uh, and we need that ship today, to be honest. We need, we need that ship today. Uh, and we don't have it because we didn't take care of it correctly. Uh, and I'm not going to allow that to go. I'm committed to not let that happen. Okay? Good. Thanks, sir. Hey, I'm Walter Warden, uh, former product, and uh, there you are correct. There is nothing better than being a product. So uh, I appreciate you putting the kill chain together for us in uh, simple terms. Uh, it's, it's a good explanation, but now as an industry partner, I, I want to ask you a question about one of your challenges to us, which is total cost of ownership reduction through. Uh, the reduction of variance. Industry really doesn't want to produce variance. We would like to produce the same thing over and over again. We produce variance because it's demanded by the left hand side of the kill chain. How can we help you reduce that when we're really getting the demand signal to produce it in the first place? Yeah. Uh, thanks for asking that question. Sewer, did you plant that with him? Okay. The, uh, uh, yeah, we know we're we know we got to work the left side. We got to get the requirements right. We have got to get. If we don't define the requirement correctly, we're not going to get the product that we're looking for. You want to you want to drive variance out of your model. You can't make a profit unless you drive variance out of your model. And we need we need to work that really really hard. 
we need to reduce our number of our uh, of our number of our type model series, uh, quite frankly, uh, because the money's in the tail. All right, it isn't it isn't the tooth at the front end; it's the tail behind it, where all the money is. And when I gave you the example of naval aviation 25 years ago, the decision when we broke ourselves down into just three three platforms, look at all that tail that we got rid of, and it's a pretty lethal force that happens to be out there. We need, but we didn't make that decision ourselves, it was made for it. So I think it's important that as we move forward, and this is one of the CEO's um, uh, messages to the CNO, is to reduce the number of our type model series um, uh, so that we can, uh, that goes to the designing it correctly, laying out the requirement correctly, so that you can then do your part on eliminating, uh, shrinking the variance. Okay, thanks for asking that question. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Hi, sir. Uh, Sydney Friedberg from AML Defense, so one of those uh, troublesome media guys. Uh, are you, where are you in the kill chain? <laughs> <laughs> I may be that He's incoming. in the assessment piece. You're right. Who said that, Matt? Yeah, he's an assessor. Uh, I, or at least a freelance irritant. Uh, you've mentioned... Uh, You're losing your train of thought. <laughs> which is eminently cool from this day. That's, 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 your, that's your, uh, your close in weapon system, sir. Uh, the, uh, you, know, you mentioned there's a lot of force structure to maintain. Congress would let you retire tax on your You mentioned those availabilities are crucial, the candy example. Uh, you may not get availabilities if we have to implement sequestration. Uh, you know, and you also mentioned that you know, perhaps even worse than a sequester uh, would be perpetual ankle biters, uh, as you put it, you know, unpredictable cuts year after year after year. So what are the biggest threats from this ongoing political crisis to your readiness? And you know, if you had to uh, get on your knees and beg Congress to, uh, to do one thing, uh, what would that be? I liked it better when I was picking on you. <laughs> I, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of interest groups out there, and you identified many of them, okay? Um, and, and an interest group is a constituent for a capability. I'm really the only fleet forces that pack fleet, that's what I'm saying I. We are the only real constituent for readiness. All right? And um, so we're going to speak out for readiness. And, and, and the reason readiness, again, is so important is that we already have tomorrow's Navy because we have 80% of it. The critical mass of tomorrow's Navy is today's Navy. Uh, and so we have to, as being the constituent for readiness, we have to articulate and we need to drum up all of the support we can for readiness, which is why community and industry is on that particular slide, on this slide up there. Okay? They, they are a huge benefit, beneficiary of readiness, and they need to be a constituent as well. It's not just the bright and shiny object. That's, uh, that's important, okay? As the constituent for readiness, we also understand war fighting really well. And I think we can be, we want to be a part of that process on the necessary, the necessary debate on the puts and takes between readiness and modernization. Sometimes we need that new bright and shiny object. Or sometimes what we got with a little bit of added capability, it'll be good enough. In a declining resource, I'm all about good enough. And make sure I have in place the necessary pieces of the industrial base. And a key element of that industrial base is the intellectual industrial base that allows us to capitalize on the far side when the sine wave starts going back up again. And I hope that answered your question. Thank you for your time today. It's great to be here with my ship.